My pleasure, Dr. Litvak. Um, hello, everyone uh, at the Seattle Science Foundation, and thank you for having me as a part of uh, this uh, fantastic brain tumor course. Um, I'm going to be uh, giving a uh, an update of um, some things we've been exploring down at USC in Los Angeles pertaining to intrinsic brain tumors and the use of uh, blue light endoscopy in conjunction with uh, 5-ALA optical fluorescence. Uh, here are my disclosures. And um, we're all aware, as many of uh, the talks allude to, that there are many ways of imaging uh, and visualizing the brain and pathology um, when performing resections or um, approaches or whatnot. And uh, there have been some newer optical imaging devices. Um, obviously, uh, exoscopes are the uh, perhaps the most recent. And and uh, it's uh, people describe these as an evolution, although they're still all being used. Um, and so uh, the question comes up, uh, is, are, is there an opti optimal way to uh, visualize uh, brain tumors? And of course, um, uh, optical fluorescence is really key and evolving rapidly. Uh, for minimally invasive surgery, we do use the endoscope and exoscope um, for a variety of uh, different approaches. This is just how we catalog them. Uh, we still use a classic neuroendoscope within the ventricles for ETVs and biopsies, as well as occasional colloid cysts, although not as often anymore with, uh, with colloid cysts um, um, because we've switched more to a port-based approach. We still do a lot of endonasal uh, skull base surgery and, and uh, occasional craniotomies with pure endoscopy. This is an example of a skull base epidermoid uh, in, in the petrous apex uh, being removed endonasally. Uh, sometimes we'll bring the endoscope in um, to assist with a keyhole craniotomy or to do a pure uh, endoscopic uh, 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 keyhole approach or operation. And then finally, in over the last decade, we've started using the exoscope more and more. Um, most often, we will use these in conjunction with a port-based approach to subcortical uh, or deep uh, cavities, whether it's uh, uh, deep-seated metastases or gliomas or even intraventricular pathology such as colloid cysts. Uh, and I think this is an evolving um, component of neurosurgery, um, especially over the last decade, as I mentioned. And here's kind of, um, again, how we categorize these and have been able to build a, a big service line uh, down in Los Angeles. Whenever we're doing a cortical or subcortical surgery, we, we obviously need to balance uh, uh, an oncological resection with functional preservation. We use any tools we can for this. Uh, we use navigation. We use functional MRI and tractography, um, awake motor and speech mapping or a sleep motor mapping, uh, whether it's cortical or subcortical motor mapping. Uh, we use standard SSCP, MEP, bear uh, monitoring and nerve, uh, cranial nerve EMG when appropriate. Occasionally we'll use real-time ultrasound uh, that can be contrast enhanced with micro bubble contrast. And finally, over the last four to five years, we've uh, used 5-ALA since its FDA approval for uh, glioma surgery. And that's what I'll be focusing on um, for the remainder of uh, this talk. And uh, this really started with a port-based approach to a deep-seated uh, glioblastoma, as you see here on the dominant side. Um, uh, this is a, a difficult tumor to get to. You could do this awake via a, a transylvian approach and um, uh, to get there. Uh, however, what we've learned over the last decade or so is that if you're going to use a port, you can take a longer approach, as, um, especially if it avoids eloquent regions. So uh, for, for lesions in the basal ganglia, anterior to the thalamus, a, a, a frontal polar approach using a port may be a preferred approach. And that's something we tried here uh, uh, using the brain path uh, port, really to try to avoid, avoid any speech or motor areas. And so this is a, a 13 millimeter dural opening. The craniotomy is a little bit bigger. We have find a sulcus, we navigate the, the, the NICO brain path in this case, and dock it right on the surface of the tumor. Here's a normal uh, white cuff, um, uh, normal uh, white matter cuff. Then we go through that and we're inside the necrotic uh, portion of the tumor. Um, you heard from the last talk, um, we're using the side cutting aspirator. In this case, it's the Myriad. And um, uh, we take whatever we can safely in this case um, and uh, SSCPs and MEPs were preserved here. And then we back the port out and um, we felt like we got a pretty good removal. 
And I'm going to stop this here. Um, you could see the bulk of the tumor was resected. And here, here's kind of a more anterior approach. What we did not see is this little satellite area. So this was still in line with a greater than 90% threshold volumetric resection for a glioblastoma. However, we, we really thought we could do better here. And again, here's this little um, a, a very small residual area there. So based on some work from UCSF and Mitch Berger's group, um, they conceived of the idea of taking a suction uh, instrument and lighting it up with blue light uh, to look at any 5-ALA um, optical fluorescence. And they found a benefit uh, when doing that. And we uh, then were able to acquire a blue light endoscope with angled lenses and started using this routinely for high-grade glioma surgery about uh, three or four years ago. And we've noticed an evolution in our practice where we're doing a lot more of this blue light intrinsic tumor endoscopy. And that's really what I want um, to try to convey to you. Um, we don't have anything like survival data or anything like that, but um, we do have extent of resection data that is known to be a proxy perhaps for survival um, based on uh, uh, several uh, articles from the UCSF group, uh, MD Anderson group, and uh, Hugues, de, uh, Hugues de Froze group in, uh, in France. And what we've noticed across the board is when you're comparing a microscope to an endoscope with blue light, um, especially in deep seated cavities, the endoscope offers um, a, a much more avid fluorescence of, uh, of residual tumor, um, especially as I mentioned in the depth and the walls of the cavity. And so here's just an example uh, uh, here of a left frontal um, eloquent region, high-grade glioma that comes to the surface. Um, you don't need a port for this. This is a, a, a great open case. And that's what we did here. Um, we, of course, did our speech and motor mapping. We identified the area of tumor interest. And I'm just going to pause here for a heads-up comparison of the endoscope on the left and the microscope on the right. You can see significantly more optical fluorescence of tumor with the endoscope and bringing the light source closer. Oh, let me go back there, excuse me. So then we start to resect our um, area after mapping and we know this is not a functional area. We send biopsies. We start with resecting the obvious component and then we bring in subcortical mapping uh, as needed. Um, there's not much fluorescence with the microscope. Um, you'll see another heads up comparison inside the cavity here. So the endoscope's on the left, microscope's on the right. And you can see how the deep portion of the tumor um, especially on the walls, is uh, lighting up a lot more, and this is consistent with residual tumor. We will toggle between blue and white light and bring in subcortical motor mapping um, and, and use that paradigm until we get as close as we can to the motor fibers without obviously getting too close, and we don't see any more avid enhancement. And that's the balance that we go for. You can see a complete removal of the enhancing component here. And um, she did have some transient speech deficits that improved uh, about a week after surgery and is uh, was essentially otherwise intact. And uh, this figure from the Journal of Neurosurgery, where we uh, have now published uh, two papers on this, show the concept of bringing the endoscope into the cavity, number one. This is a similar paradigm um, for, for endoscopy and skull-based surgery. We, we learned that when you bring the endoscope into a corridor, you, you then you really can uh, leverage the benefits of panoramic visualization, number one, improved illumination, number two, and angled lenses, number three. And we think there may be a role for that for endoscopic assistance of high-grade glioma intrinsic surgery when used correctly. And that's what this uh, schematic is showing here. The angled lens and bringing the light into the cavity can show residual tumor. This was our series of biopsies open resections and port-based resections. I'm going to show a, a case of a biopsy here of a butterfly GBM. We decided not to um, offer surgery in conjunction with the patient's wishes. Uh, she was an older woman who did not want a resection um, and uh, uh, was okay with a biopsy and standard treatment. So what we do is we use a very small port for this. This is about a nine millimeter OD port. And then we use our endoscope through the port. Again, the blue light endoscope. The benefit of this is you know exactly what tissue to take. Uh, and uh, instead of waiting for frozen pathology in this instance, you can see where the fluorescent tissue is and is not. And we have had a 100% diagnostic rate 
when biopsying fluorescing tissue for high-grade gliomas. And uh, we feel that there may, may be a benefit for this paradigm as well, instead of the time that it takes uh, for needle biopsies that are stereotactically guided, which have an appreciable non-diagnostic biopsy rate. So I already shared uh, this case. I'm going to share another case here of an occipital uh, a glioblastoma, um, a little bit deeper, deeper from the surface. So this is when we decided to do a port-based approach on and then bring the endoscope in through the port. And so this was a standard um, uh, parietal occipital approach. We try to go down the long axis of the tumor. And at the beginning, there's nothing really fancy about this. We're in obvious tumor. It's necrotic. We've sent uh, pathology already. We're now debulking it. But now here's the angled endoscope into the port. And you can see the avidly flu uh, fluorescing tissue that we did not see during our standard approach. And as we back the port out, we're seeing significant more fl uh, fluorescence here of tissue. And again, we'll use this paradigm until we feel that we've maximally resected a tumor. And again, you can see a little bit more hiding there. When needed, we'll, we'll switch this off with subcortical stimulation to, to preserve function. In this, in this area, it was not as critical. And then you could see postoperatively, we were able to achieve a complete removal and the patient went on to have a uh, standard uh, therapy after that. Uh, so again, this was our series um, uh, of 30 patients and we uh, recently published this in, in the Journal of Neurosurgery and just some more illustrative uh, pictures here. Um, uh, and then this was just published, uh, I think it's actually still in pre-publication in the Journal of Neurosurgery, From White to Blue Light, describes our experience of transitioning from skull base uh, and uh, an extra axial tumor endoscopic assistance to actually using an endoscopes for intrinsic brain tumors um, as we are perceiving what may be a benefit here. So rather than some uh, evolution from microscopes to endoscopes to exoscopes, we use these interchangeably based on the case with white light or blue light. We think they're all valuable instruments and really depends on the location of the tumor, tumor type and, and case. And, and one thing on the horizon uh, from the Integra Corporation, I am a consultant for Integra, FYI, is this new paradigm of, of building the optical technology into the port. Um, this is a disposable port called the Aurora, where uh, it's essentially a repurposed iPhone camera that is attached to the, uh, the port that you select. And we've now done uh, three or four cases with this. This was a brain metastasis, but we do not have blue light on this currently. However, I do want to show that the visualization, um, even though it's 2D, is pretty good uh, for achieving uh, um, resection of a, a mass even adjacent to vessels. And um, the nice thing is every time you move the port, the, the image moves with you and you do, you're not reliant on exoscopic technology that needs to follow the trajectory of the port um, or, or some kind of coaxial trajectory. So this is uh, some new technology on the horizon that I'm excited about. In conclusion, um, I hope I've conveyed to you that our early experience suggests a potential benefit from introducing a proximal blue light light source and optimizing fluorescence of 5-ALA um, administered uh, cases for high-grade glioma. We do need prospective validation, um, uh, but there, there has been very little downside and risk of doing this. And um, we think the benefits are derived from um, introducing the light source, angled endoscopy, and improved illumination. And again, I'd like to really thank Dr. Litvak um, and, and uh, uh, the Swedish and Seattle Science Foundation team uh, for the opportunity to uh, speak here today. And I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you. Gabriel, this is uh, Charles Cobbs. Thank you so much. Uh, Zach, do you want to have any closing comments? And then I need to make a, f a few final closing comments. Yeah, Gabby, just one question. Um, in your experience, how much of the improved fluorescence uh, with doing intratumoral endoscopy, do you think is from getting the light in there versus having the receiver closer and not losing the fluorescence to backscatter? It's a great question. We we think we're seeing more fluorescence, more avid, more fluorescence from bringing the light source closer. Um, it, we're we're trying to prove this um, objectively with spectral analytics, but that's a work in progress. That's, that's, that will be one of the next validation steps, but, um, you are absolutely right. That, that, uh, scatter probably plays a role in that too. And, uh, thank you, Dr. Cobb as well for the opportunity.
Yeah, thank you. That was a great talk. Um, so I do want to make some final comments. I want to thank everyone so much, especially the staff here at Seattle Science Foundation. And the I want to thank um, the sponsors so much for helping us put this a great day of research, education, and clinical brain tumor education on.